Hello, thank you so much for the invitation. Hi everyone, thanks for hanging in there. I'd like to take you on a journey. Uh, we'll go to space, Mars, and then come full circle back to Earth. Just um, take you on an exploration. I'm an engineer, an aerospace biomedical engineer, and thinking about how we can empower astronauts and people here on Earth as well. I'd like to introduce my partner in life and discovery and innovation, Guy Trotti, as well. This project and the projects we'll talk about are, are done collaboratively. Spacesuit 101, we had an incredible spacesuit. This is the Apollo suit. You probably haven't seen these. These are my Apollo bloopers. This was over 40 years ago. Science, well, okay, we didn't do so well in the science because we couldn't bend down and get our instruments, but this is a life support system. The middle slide is our current NASA spacesuit, the extravehicular mobility unit. It weighs about 140 kilos. We're approaching 300 pounds. It's okay in weightlessness up on the International Space Station because we're floating around. Uh, it's about uh, 10 or so. Um, billion a pop, so you know, a lot of R&D in there. But it doesn't afford us great mobility and performance. It keeps us alive. It's the world's smallest spacecraft. It gives you everything you need. Your pressure, your oxygen, scrubs your carbon dioxide, thermal control. So it really is a magnificent engineering marvel. But we'd just like to do a little bit better. We haven't improved technology too much over the last four decades of human spaceflight. It's a robot in my lab, so we'd really like the spacesuit to enable exploration. Here you'll see Rudolph, one of my fantastic students. So why can't the robot is just our surrogate astronaut? Because it gives us great data and can't poke and prod too much and look at these joint torques and performance measurements. So we just kind of dress up the robot. My robot's called M Tall Chief, in case anyone knows uh, why we named it M Tall Chief. And so we're looking at it to give us data about how we can improve and kind of really revolutionize spacesuit design. Okay, so I like to juxtapose. I think you might um, realize the image on the, recognize the image on the left, but maybe not the image on the right. Are you familiar with Duchamp? So the image on the right is one of my students dressed up in a spacesuit with a light on, the helmet. Kind of reminded me of Duchamp's descending nude, and, but we're out in the Arizona desert doing a field study to try to see how we can improve performance and design new systems for the future exploration of the moon and Mars in particular. So in the background here is an infographic of all the world's EVAs, extravehicular activity or spacewalks. What you're gonna see here in the video, again, not flown systems. These aren't spacesuits that you've ever seen fly. But I think these were some great ideas. Who says a spacesuit has to be a big white Michelin man looking thing that weighs 140 kilos? It could be a hamster cage. As long as I pressurize you, put you inside, keep you alive, maybe not too practical, but this was fantastic. It was in the late 60s out of the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins. You just kind of strap on your Apollo arms and legs for mobility and run around. Why not? Again, I'd like to show this to my students to just say, let's, let's think about you know, a new paradigm. How could we do things very differently? Not too fast. All right, well, I'm going to give credit to Dr. Paul Webb, who came up with the space activity system. This is mechanical counterpressure. You're not in a big pressurized gas field shell. You're applying the pressure, about a third of an atmosphere. You need pressure to stay alive in the vacuum of space. So you're applying the pressure directly to the skin. So I call this the second skin. So Dr. Webb had this incredible idea in 1971. It may be a great idea way before its time, in my opinion. He didn't have the materials development that we have today. Definitely afforded maximum mobility, and now you can get on with your real business of serious exploration in a capability like this. Here's the problem and why NASA didn't fund it anymore. It's really nice in space to dress yourself because you don't have a lot of buddies out there. So you don't get uh, two suit techs to kind of wrap you up, and this kind of looks like a leotard for a two-year-old. In the spacesuit world, we call putting on your clothes donning and taking off your clothes doffing. So here is the donning doffing problem. <laughs> Takes a while, you don't want to wait that long to get dressed, it's a, it's a bit of an issue. And so it was really never heard about again. 
You can see it goes on and on. So it was really never heard about again since the early 70s. But remember that because it really is a huge inspiration for our bio suit work. In the, in the background, what you're looking at in my, my infographic is the world's history of spacewalks or extravehicular activities, those little white dots. We're currently at the International Space Station and it's completed. In human history, we've done just over 500 pairs of EVA. You always go out with a buddy like scuba diving. But our Mars mission, it's going to take us about six months to get to Mars. You're going to be exploring about 600 days on the surface of Mars. And it'll take you about a year and a half to get home. So I, the scale ran out. But just that first Mars mission with people, we're going to have to do over 1,000 spacewalks or extravehicular activities. So we need a completely different type of capability to really enable the ex exploration of Mars. So this is a mock-up of our biosuit that I have here. I'm going to talk to you about it over the next slides. Hopefully, at least the folks in the front can, can take a look at it, ask me questions about it. It really is a, a second skin. This is the pressure-producing part of the spacesuit. So again, we call it mechanical counterpressure. We're applying the pressure directly on the skin, and I need to apply about a third of an atmosphere, 30 kilopascals, 4.3 pounds per square inch, whatever units you'd like. I prefer SI units. Does NASA gets in trouble when we use English units? And um, yeah, just that was just a rover mission. That, those are cheap. Those are only hundreds of millions of dollars for rovers. But human missions are, you know, billion-dollar price tags. So we got to keep our units straight. And, uh, but let me tell you about Mars a little bit. Um, it's fantastic. I mean, this is extreme exploration. Olympus Mons, Mount Everest, right? Valles Marineris, the Grand Canyon is great. Grand Canyon, I'm from the, I'm from the West. Grand Canyon, right? No, 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 no. Valles Marineris stretches across the entire United States. Now we're talking great place to go look. And I'm glad you're working on this sequencing because I need to find the evidence of life from 4.5 billion years ago. So <laughs> just rapid sequences, just the evidence of past life, but Mars is a really cold, dead place as far as we know. But why is it so important to go there and, and look for the evidence of life? Because we'll learn so much about ourselves. We'll learn so much about Earth. We'll rewrite all the science books if potentially there was perhaps at one point in time, maybe billions of years ago, the evidence of life on Mars. And then what went wrong with Mars? What went so terribly wrong that it completely lost its life support and potential life. And so it's a real lesson for us to reflect back on the Earth. You see a little animation going on because um, this design of the suit kind of looks like a Spider-Man suit, if you will. Well, it's actually uh, just math. And so if I want to design something for you and give you full mobility and full flexion, and if I draw circles all over your skin, uh, we've done that. <laughs> we keep them on for a while in the lab. Now we can do it digitally. Well, imagine you move. That circle is going to turn elliptical. But there's two bisecting diameters. Those two red lines, those are my two bisecting diameters. They pivot, but they haven't changed length. So we call these the lines of non-extension. So we make a three-dimensional map of this patterning. Now, people are really very complicated three-dimensional shapes. We're squishy and bones and muscles. But we can get this patterning. And so we come up with basically the design. It's the black lines in this mock-up here. And then there's some gold lines that go in. That's where we put kind of the active sensors. But the black lines are really important because this is my kind of soft exoskeleton. So that's the design that, that we've pursued. I want to give credit to Ibral because geometrically he thought of these lines of non-extension. And then mathematically, we derived them. So we put Ibral's and Webb's great ideas, hopefully together, to come up with, it, with a new capability. This is, um, we've been really fortunate to get a lot of good PR. The reason I have this slide up here is to highlight my wonderful for students. And, he, and the best thing about this is that um, the outreach. I um, really do a lot of work in outreach and STEM, but I've turned it to STEAM, try it out on all of you. I really think that it's science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Because then we can include everyone. Because we need all the young people to pursue um, technology, science, and their passions, because we need every great little brain that's out there with the challenges that we're facing currently. And I guess once you make it to Wallace and Gromit, you know, in my mind, we made it. <laughs> but I never got to meet Wallace and Gromit because they told me they weren't done yet. They spent a week in our lab filming, but Wallace and Gromit weren't made yet. So I'm a big claymation fan. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. Won't fall down on you. 
<laughs> keep you awake, you're patient by sticking with us in this late session. So in summary, what are we looking at? We, our design is to maximize mobility, give you freedom of movement so you're not fighting the suit. All of your energy needs to go into doing your exploration. Um, suit my size, these black lines, it's about 340 meters. Yes, uh, three football lengths, 340 meters um, in length with 140,000 stitches. We're minimizing your energy output, and then we incorporate active materials to even get a little bit extra pressure production, because again, we're going for a third of an atmosphere in terms of overall pressure. We have a technology roadmap of about 10 technologies we're pursuing. I just put one up here. Um, maybe you've heard of electro spin lacing, maybe not. I think it's incredibly cool, and credit to a couple of colleagues who are working on this, and the Hammond Lab and Rutledge Lab. So, because I know the patterning, I know the design, I know the capability I want. I'm not a material scientist, so I go to these great material scientists and say, I need this three-dimensional weave. Can you produce it with certain polymers? Because I know how elastic it has to be in this direction, but it's anisotropic. Skin? Let me tell you, I know way too much about skin for an aerospace engineer. This is one beautiful, elegant design. What an organ we have here. So trying to even approximate a second skin design has, has been wonderful, but also a huge challenge for us. Just this year, then recently, we've just show you a mock-up of it here, but now we're moving on into uh, the helmet and the whole life support system so that potentially we might have a, have a flight system. And uh, the commercial space business is burgeoning and um, they're pretty interested in, in suits in the, the future. Just one slide up here in terms of um, what technologies we might be looking at, what technologies are we looking at for, for NASA, some wonderful things in terms of rovers and, and robotics. And then my specialty is really looking at superhuman, superhuman performance, especially if we can incorporate some of our mechanical counterpressure designs and ideas using augmentation, you know, actuation, augmentation type of technologies just to help people balance. We're supposed to rebalance here, but if someone has pathology, you'd just like to help them balance and then take their first steps. Strength and speed, how fast could a person really run? Not steroid induced, just uh, mechanically assisted. We kind of see a world um, that's void of disability. Can we just get rid of disability? If we can take technology and human capability and find this synergy why can't everyone walk and perform and do all the daily activities that they'd like to do? So this is kind of how we think about our future development and, and bringing it down to Earth. So I just have a couple slides I want to share on that. So thinking about some of our space work down to Earth, when you go into space for a long duration, months, like up on the International Space Station, you're going to lose about 30% of your muscle mass. You're going to atrophy 30, and 40% muscle loss. But that's the good news. The bad news is you're going to lose 1 to 2% bone mineral density per month. Now who wants to go on my four-year Mars mission? <laughs> I still usually get student volunteers. So we're up on space station for six months now. But we have to understand the mechanisms of this really significant bone loss. Why? Because it's so important for us here on Earth, because it helps us think about the mechanisms of osteoporosis. Because up on space station, again, 1 to 2% per month, but normal aging, 40 to 50, maybe you might lose a half a percent. When you're 50 years old to 60, you're probably going to use a 1% bone. When you're 60 years old to 70, you might lose 1 to 2, but that's over decades. So Space Station is fantastic. It really is a global world laboratory to start studying some of these things. So what you see here is what we call a gravity loading countermeasure suit. It's kind of like an exercise suit. This blue suit is actually for inside the vehicle. So the astronauts can be working out against that. We load through the shoulders, back down to the feet, so you have one body weight. You recreate one body weight, because we've evolved and developed in this 1G acceleration environment here on Earth. So when we're floating around, you know, our bones and muscles are really deteriorating physiologically quite quickly. So can we recreate that then? And it really makes a lot of sense if you put little foot tappers in there. It's like a free massage. Put a little vibration in your soles. Why do we want to do that? Well, that, uh, that frequency, uh, 30, 40 hertz frequency, could be enough to stimulate the bone and make sure we don't go through this musculoskeletal loss. And then the little person you see over on the, the right there, it's a little person with cerebral palsy. So we're taking a look at some of our designs. Again, this exercise suit, kind of a bungee assisted suit. You can just get those muscles and bones working against this kind of like a resistive exercise capability. Try to help them just again, in this case, just performing daily activities, just mobility. So then currently, we're looking at that 
for the children with cerebral palsy. It's funded by the National Science Foundation. This one is we're really we're modeling a great extent. You have to go into a laboratory, either clinically or, or at the universities, have all these markers on. You can track the performance in three dimensions, but that's very expensive. These systems are very expensive. We want to throw all those away, give you a little quarter-shaped um, IMU. That's an inertial measurement unit. Strap it on your legs. It's wireless. Give this to the parents. So now they can go home. Now they have a mobile lab. Now we can track the performance and are those movements and are those legs and is that locomotion um, you know, much more normal, we'll say. And the biggest scientific hypothesis we're going after right now is looking at infants. That's a tough one, zero to two years old. But the hypothesis is the brain is so plastic. If we can just, when the little folks with cerebral palsy, I can never cure cerebral palsy, but if we can just help them. And so we're studying the leg motions, and can we increase those leg motions, and basically make a little designer suit for them, if you will. Smart little pants that can help with the actuation, give them full mobility, just with some actuation. And if we can get them young enough, maybe those motor programs in the brain will remain, and they become bipeds and start walking. Maybe they'll have a much um, fuller range of, of exploration and activity here on Earth. And a current uh, project looking at a suit within a suit for astronauts. The astronauts are getting dinged up, kind of beat up, and a lot of injuries, a lot of shoulder surgery after you come back, say, from a Hubble Space Telescope repair. You didn't know about that. They don't like to advertise that. But we need to help them out. So kind of comfort protection. Why is this project so important? Sure, it might help our astronauts. But more importantly is we can apply it here for folks that are aging, broken hips, falls. If we can prevent that and have some great designs to do that, we could hopefully help and really improve the quality of life for some folks here. So I want to end um, with an image from uh, Apollo 8 brought us the first time we looked at the Earth, this blue dot, this very fragile blue dot. And um, I like to think about that if we shrink Earth down and really reflect to a basketball size, our atmosphere's three human hairs. You can't even see it when you shrink it down. So this is our life support system. It's the only one we have, inspired by Bucky Fuller, Spaceship Earth. You know, we're just visiting temporarily, and we have to make the best of our of our time here. And the idea of Mini Earth from, from Bucky, who Guy was fortunate to be advised with and, and work with, was that in the United Nations, why don't you have all the world leaders looking out at Earth? Now we have the computing technology to look out at it. So at all times, when world leaders are making decisions, you're forecasting the wars that are going on, the climate change, the poverty, the hunger, what have you. Giving that information to people, having it front and center, so that you're always very cognizant of that maybe uh, we'd be a bit more enlightened and it makes some great decisions. So kind of full circle uh, from space to Mars to Earth, tell you a little bit about what we're doing and uh, thank you for your attention.